Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lionheart Radio with your host, Rick Alexander. Today, I'm speaking with Emily Schramm. Emily owns five different businesses. She's got a massive following on social media. And she started out actually on MTV Real World way back in the day and then uh, sort of parlayed that into this really incredible career where she's really impacting the world in a positive way. She's also the host of the Meathead Hippie podcast. And right away, uh, Emily and I connected on a ton of different things. So if you like my message and you like the things that I'm about, uh, you'll definitely love this episode. She's just a great human being doing really great things in the world. In this conversation, we really go uh, full spectrum. We talk about training, we talk about lifestyle, we talk about diet and all of the uh, different things that encompass well-being. And like I said, she has a great outlook, tons of experience. So please give it up for Emily Schramm. things that I've grown to really like about certain people that are influencers within the health and fitness community. One of the things that I've picked on that makes their message a little bit more authentic is when their platform, their products, the things that they do and the message that they stand for is sort of a reaction to some kind of adversity. And so that's how you know it's like whatever their ideas are about motivation or growth have actually been stress tested in some kind of arena and they're not just recycled Instagram garbage for lack of a better term. And so I thought what where we could start is maybe go to the beginning, some of the adversities that you faced that that served as a catalyst for this sort of crazy lifestyle that you've built yourself. Oh, that's a fantastic first question. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for having me on. I'm really excited to chat. And especially after that question, that's a beautiful first way to introduce this because I do see the same things that you see where it's just, oh my God, again, are we talking about this again? <laughs> you know? And yeah. I, I think, I think we're all in this place of trying to figure out where we fit in and the message that we want to convey and who we are in this world. But I always think that the process, you know, it's good to share the process, but it's also good to be vulnerable that you don't have it figured out. And so when people are saying so, some statements on social media so definitively, it's just all bullshit because we are all still figuring it out. And so I think that's really the coolest thing about what's happened in my life is that everything was just started. It started, it was ignited because of curiosity. And I think the biggest thing, if I could think of the first thing of adversity or really being uncomfortable enough to push me to the to the place that I wanted to create change in myself was seeing myself on reality TV. I think that was honestly what it was. I think it took, you know, you can look in the mirror and you can kind of avoid things and you can delete pictures you don't want to see, but there's something very big about saying, oh shit, I'm on TV right now and I hate who that is to the point where this experience, which I should be excited about and it should just be a learning experience, it was it was like I was ashamed of it. I didn't watch it. I didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, I really retracted from that life. I didn't want to do anything about it. And so I try to retract. I try to run away. And that running away just left me empty and sad. And I was like, okay, so there's no running away from this. What can I do? And the only thing I knew, it just was like this calling, go to the gym. And I didn't know, I've always been going to the gym. You know, I played soccer growing up. I played all the sports. I loved being the tomboy athlete, but I never had a system when I was in the gym. I would just make things up when I was there. And so really kind of pushing myself into the gym and and feeling, oh shit, I can really change my body. I can really put my mind to something and commit because I thought I was that person that could never say no to cheesecake or could never say no to talk Taco Bell. Like that was, I mean, this is going way back. This is college days of, I would always be the person that didn't feel like I had self-control and I didn't have commitment and I would try things and I would fail things. And I realized the things I was trying and failing at, it was just a horrible fit. It was unsustainable and it just wasn't real life. It was one of, it was either a crash diet or binge and purge. So that was really my first step into ultimately the career that I have now with health and wellness, but really making sure people understand that they have all the tools if they are finding the right fit for them. Mm. I love that. It's something I've noticed but for a lot of the a lot of the people in this space that have sort of made a good brand for themselves is like 
Well, one, I love this idea that they just are vulnerable in the fact that you're just waking up every day and making it up like everybody else. Um, but the big thing is I, I, what I see is people tend to distance, if they see somebody, let's say like yourself with a big following and a good, in a, in sort of a, their voice kind of cemented and what they're doing in the community, it's easy to distance ourselves from, from that and be like, well, they don't understand the struggles I'm going through because I'm the person that can't say no to cheesecake or I'm the person that, you know, fill in whatever sort of pleasure seeking behaviors right there. And so I just think it's so interesting that that you're willing to be vulnerable about that. And I think that's probably one of the things that really helps people identify and connect with what you're doing. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, it's, it's so frustrating when you see this huge divide of like, yeah, my cravings are gone if you just eat more vegetables. But in real life, it's, it's, we, if I think about it, the thing that's always stuck with people, the, the hardest where it's just relatability and understanding, like, even though we feel far away from that, and we've been doing this for eight, seven, eight years or however long, and it feels like forever ago, like thinking back, how do I get that person that feels like they've tried it all and they just are stuck? How do I get them to remember that it's not, it's not over yet? They still have a, they have a chance to really change their life around. And so then you just have to put yourself in that position. And I, it's, it's always, it comes out when I write about it. If I like think of, you know, if I'm writing something about, well, what happened when you wanted to change your life? And you're like, oh, well, I decided to go to the gym. So I think it's cool. So I think if you're a social media influencer, if you're a business owner, like digging into details about what made you change that decision or make that decision to change and like as close, like as much as you can remember, that's what people resonate with. That's what makes people stick. Because if not, you're unaccessible. You're too far away. It's, it's like, oh, that's a good idea. I'm inspired. Maybe I'll try that workout. But I'm not good enough to be that person when, in fact, you you absolutely are. Mm. I love that you sort of gave a little insight into your process there. But one of the things I often say is that I like read to make sense of the world, but then I write to make sense of my world because it helps me to sort of organize all the thoughts I have bouncing around my head every day. Do you journal? Uh, what kind of writing practice do you have as far as that goes? Oh yeah. So I recently started this. So I've always, um, I was like the weird kid that wrote poetry at a very young age. Yeah. So, uh, and I remember feeling it was almost like too dark. So for a long time I stopped doing it because I didn't want to feel. And it, it poetry comes out when you are really feeling you, you aren't numbing it. And I think, um, it was a moment I was visiting back home. And when I was six, I decided for Christmas presents, I was going to make everyone a poetry book. <laughs> and uh, I grew up in a really weird situation where I actually grew up in a, what I call the cult. And so this is like dark six-year-old poetry. This isn't like, I love my mom. I love my dad. My, my dog is cool. It was really intense. And when I read it and I was like, a six-year-old version of me wrote this that is insane because I can relate to this as a 29 year old, you know? So I finally realized that poetry for me is the only way that I express things that I don't know how to express. It's just, I close my eyes and I just write. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't want the lines. I sometimes just type and I just let it out. And if I wait too long, I will finish like an airplane ride with no Wi-Fi, with pages of just thoughts and randomness. And then you can look at it, you know, maybe not right away look at it because it's a little overwhelming. You just let it sit there. And then two days later, you read it and you're just like, what? I wrote that? I was going through that? And you can start to put together trends of what experience got that out of me? What experience allowed me to feel that, whether it was euphoria or whether it was darkness, you know, and not being afraid to like not running away from it, but understanding that we are all, we are all so complicated. And I always say that I'm just such a nut job. Like I really am a nut job. And the only way that I feel good is I have these journals uh, and I carry them everywhere and I write any of my thoughts. I draw sketches and yeah, that's definitely, that's a huge piece of my process. And a whiteboard. A whiteboard is also like one of my favorite top three things in the world. So whiteboards with a well replenished marker and some notebooks. Mm. <laughs> All right. So there's a good amount of stuff to unpack, I think, from that. But one of the Sorry. things, no, I love it. One of the things I really like, um, you know, I think we've, we spend so much time trying to regulate the darkness out of our lives like we we focus on happiness as if that would be 
a complete life, but the reality is that life is often both, right? And and it's interesting because you can look back at some of, at least for me, I look back at some of the most fire I've ever written was like when I was going through these really painful, dark times. And so I think having an outlet like you have, and maybe you can just comment on this, but having an outlet like you have to sort of make sense of what's going on in your head when you're going through these dark times, the times that most people would rather avoid, and then to be able to to take something out of that to like that your future self can go back and read like that's a really powerful process that's available to everybody that most people don't don't do it seems like yeah i and i think it's because we avoid we don't want to feel pain or we feel like pain is weakness and we want to showcase us feeling happy and i will you know i want to have this expectation. I want others to see this expectation. I honestly think it all comes down to ego. It comes down to how we want the world to see us. And, uh, that might not be very much that, you know, I think people see ego is a chip on their shoulder and like talking about themselves all the time, but it's not, it's what do you care about so much that other people see that really isn't the truth. And so really making sure that you understand that everything you're putting out into the world or everything that you want to do in this life, the pure purpose is not how others see you. It is because if you didn't do it, it would, it would hurt. It would, it's, it has to come out of you. It's something that is either to help others or it's a part of you to an extent that even tattoos, you know, I always, like, I love tattoos. It's like, it was always meant to be there. It just surfaced. Like Mm. I think of, I think of that as the work that you put in the world. And so when you look at people that are going through, whether it's the trying to be an influencer, trying to build their business, trying to change somebody's life in the training health world, uh, if you have external purposes, even though you might not know it is, have that honest conversation with yourself. Am I doing this because I want to look a certain way? I want to be perceived a certain way. Or am I doing this because if I didn't do it, I would be nothing. I would feel like, like it almost is like when I have something to put out in the world, it's like in my chest and it hurts. Like if it doesn't come out, I'm going to go crazy. So I think just knowing your intention can always help unpack, uh, the way that we wait, maybe we walk in this world a little bit. I, I think that was a total tangent and I don't know if that answered your question, but that is my thoughts that came when you asked that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Uh, okay. So you know, this is something I'm really interested in. So the idea that some things resonate with you and some things don't, and when you engage in certain activities, like for me, writing is one of those activities where I feel like fully alive. It makes me think that there's a thing on this earth that I'm supposed to be doing and that I can't necessarily do whatever I want. Like from a technical standpoint, I can, but there's like part of my soul that will pay the price for living an inauthentic life to what makes me feel really alive. And so for people that are listening to this, because you've it seemed seemingly had so much success finding that path for yourself. What, I mean, if you want to just maybe comment on that or talk about some of the ways that people can go about figuring that out for themselves. Cause I think that a lot of people are stuck. Yeah. Well, you know, um, when you find that thing, I, and the first thing that comes to my mind is this is kind of the root. And I never, I think there's enough people talking about find your purpose and there's enough room in the world for all of us to have our purpose. I think we all know that we've all heard that, Mm -hmm. but the, the truth of it comes out when, when you want to succeed as much as you want to breathe, then you will be successful. And I know that's such a dramatic quote, but it truly is the sense of urgency that you have to have. And if you don't have that, then there is no shift that will happen. Anytime you get to the point of, I am, I'm so uncomfortable. I hate this. I, I have to make a change. That's when change happens. But if we're kind of living in this limbo of complacency and it's kind of a good idea or it feels kind of good, um, or maybe it's, maybe I could do that that will get you nowhere. It's like telling somebody, I'm going to go try this workout. There is no try. You either are going to do it or you're not. You either show up and you give it your all or you don't. And that's why I think with business and it ties into my personality, it's, it is that kind of, I am all in and you know, it might mean I live off of tuna for a couple months. It might mean that I have no idea what I'm doing, but I will always figure it out because I know that this is my purpose. So you, we we get this idea of purpose, but can that purpose resonate so strongly in you that it is coming out of your being? Like it is, you know, you can't stop talking about it when you have a 
I remember thinking this, like, what do I even care about? And it was when I was doing a couple different things, fitness, nutrition. I just had started the MPAC. And when I would do a lunch and learn in front of people and talk about the, like basically what, what your cravings are telling you. So your micro deficient nutrient deficiencies, so random, but there's something about like the people in my life were like, you get so excited about nutritional deficiencies. And it's true. It's the people around you. They'll know what lights you up. So I knew that I had to focus on that. I knew that I had to make sure that, um, that was what I put my heart and soul in, even though practically it might not have made a lot of sense on paper, you know, as far as finances went, but I knew if I kept doing it, it would get to the right people. And if you just follow that calling, the doors open for you, but you can't follow that calling if it's, going to look good. If it's that ego thing that you're listening to, or if it's kind of, I could, or I should, it's, I absolutely have to do this. Yeah. It is difficult to know whether the sort of call to adventure that you're hearing is from the higher self or from the ego, because we have all this programming and patterning that's like essentially told us what the world expects of us and like what we should do, what, what would look good, what would look good to society. And we have all these built up success metrics that really don't mean shit in the long term. Uh, but, but we have a tendency to let those control the narrative in our head. And so is there any kind of practice and maybe it's meditation or anything that you rely on to sort of tune the world out and tune the inputs out so you can make sure you're staying in alignment with what you want? Oh, that's a great question. I am, I'm going to be fully honest. I'm fucking horrible at meditation and I need to get so much better at it, but it's something I have to do. Uh, but honestly, my meditation is, nature. It is always being outside and not having emails, not having phone, cutting social media time, whatever your social media time is, look up on your, you, what is it called? The screen time? Yeah. And screen time and your settings. Cut it in half. That, that alone, that step will allow you to have clear channels because you can't have clear channels which, with as much input sensory overload as we have. It's insane, I think. And it's easy for no matter what level you are, whether you're just starting or whether you have done this for five years, if you don't just clear those paths to feel like you're in your own lane. Um, I, I had a great talk. Somebody said, you know, if you don't know your lane, create it, you know, and you can't create your own lane when all you see is other people and the work that they're doing, you're going to just pick and choose and pull. And then all of a sudden it's not who, not the expression of you that it could be. It's not just not authentic. So I guess my overall is, uh, really making sure that you get outside and be in nature and, go explore and do things that are awesome. Uh, whether I know you're in San Diego, whether that's being at the beach or when you come to Colorado, snowboarding is my number one. And then number two, really cut social media. So when you get into that cycle, that's kind of the first thing I do is like, all right, my phone's off. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my own thing for a while. And then it's more, it, then it's back to the whiteboard. And if I just feel like I need direction, it's whiteboarding it out. And the words that need to come out and the things that you need to do are going to be the first things that get onto that paper or that whiteboard. And then that's where I say, okay, that's clearly something that needs to happen. Let's make this happen. Mm. Do you, is there a process or, or maybe there, I don't know, but do you, is there a, how often do you strategize versus how often are you like, implementing and I'm just thinking for people that are looking to build themselves in the industry. That's a great point. Yeah. So, uh, I started my first business in 2012, so it was training and then turned online and then it turned into product companies starting in 2016. And so really in the last year has been the first time where I have a team of 15 people of, okay, I can delegate this. So there's two answers. If you're first starting out and you're first doing, then you should be figuring out a game plan for every month. Like what is the goal for this month? What is our focus? Whether that you do that a few months in advance or whether you do it a month in advance. I mean, it's just whatever you're able to do. One thing that I found when I was doing it, the way my personality is, if I scheduled too far in advance, I felt like I wasn't in the right space to put it out there. So if I was ready... I knew that my promotion of it was authentic. I knew that my energy was tangible and palpable. Like people would feel it because I was like, this is, this is happening. But if I waited too long and I tried to like plan and strategize too much, then I would miss it. It was like, I missed the wave. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, that's a good idea on paper, but I don't feel that excited about it, which always translates into sales. Like it meant that 
less people were going to join that challenge. Less people were going to be excited about it too because no matter what, even if the marketing material is on point, if my energy wasn't behind it, theirs weren't going to be, it wasn't going to translate to my audience. So go ahead. No, that's such great advice. I, I really found that like a lot of high performers have the ability to tie in emotion to their the thing that they're doing. And it's not, not to say emotion should take the place of reason, like you're not like being reckless, but I just mean cultivating passion around the thing that you're doing. It's an intangible, so we have no way of like making a metric around it to value it, and so we tend not to, but it's so important. I like I've seen it in my own launches, my own my own stuff. Like you have to be on fire about the thing you're doing in the world, especially if it's like against the grain. Because if not, then it's no different than sitting in an office, you know, with four walls. Like you're just saying, okay, I'm doing the work because I have to do the work. So for me, it was finding the team that I was bringing on as I grew saying, I, you guys have to know how I operate when it's ready. Like I'm ready to launch this program. That means we have to launch it within two weeks or it's going to, that wave has been gone. So the way the team works originally was like, boom, cool, put this together, help you execute and then implement. And that was awesome because I started to see, wow, I can be so much more creative without having to worry about the logistics, plugging in the challenges, helping with promotion, discount codes, marketing, newsletters. There's so much that went on the back end that took away from me just being excited about the product. So then those products did even better because I was fully focusing on the energy translating what the product was. So that was a wonderful kind of shift in, okay, I can build this in a way that even though it's not as systemized as people would say in the book that you read about business, it still is working for what I'm doing right now. And then you can kind of get into, so now, so I have... Uh, five companies and all of them have their own strategy meeting. We have a check-in meeting every week, but a strategy meeting for every quarter. And so it's a full, I want them to see my brain. I want them to know my direction. I want them to know my goals for that quarter. And then it's saying, working backwards, well, okay, if that's our goal for this quarter, what do we need to do to get to that point? And so strategizing has become the fun part because then it's just communicating to the team and been really cool that way. But most of it is implementation. It's maybe one big strategy meeting and check-ins and then the rest is let's make sure this is getting done. So you started your first company in 2012, so like six years ago. Did you did you kind of always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur or had to kind of do your own thing? I mean, I knew I was a rebel, like the four tendencies, Gretchen Rubin. Uh-huh. I've, al- I've always been someone terrible under authority in, in real, <laughs> in <Same>. real job. <laughs> yeah. I don't do well with it. Especially, uh, especially I just really butted heads with a lot of men that were ahead of like above me and I just, I don't handle it well. So I knew that that was something I was always going to have to work on, but it really got bad when I was, um, I had, was working at Starbucks went through this gym transformation, really understood, okay, I think I'm going to be a trainer. I think that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't know if that's a long-term goal. I just know that I know enough to really help people change this mindset of what the gym could look like for them. And so when I was in the process of becoming a trainer and I was like washing dogs on on the side and then training at a 24-hour fitness, oh my God, I just was surrounded by people that just, oh, it was just the worst. And it was in that moment where I was like, there's no way I can do this unless I start my own business. It wasn't even, I mean, if I was at a gym, maybe like my gym where I was like, I could fit this. I like the vibe. People respect me. People talk to me, but being a female, a young female trying to be a trainer when you can lift more than the men was not a good combo. So it was very much, okay, that's the only way I know how to do this is if I do this on my own. And so I had, I I would have a no desire to even say, sometimes even saying I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I know I am, but it's just, everything came out of an a process that I went through and a necessity or an ask from a client. So it got, it just built one after the other, one after the other. And it, I had no intention of doing it, but it, you know, it's the best job in the world now that I've doing it, but it's definitely not what I expected. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's like life is a series of going through these flow charts and getting what you can and hitting wrong turns and bumps and bruises. And it's like, sometimes you get to this point and you look back and you're like, is there any way I could have done that with like just a little more streamlined, but there isn't like you have to go through that process of finding your voice and figuring out who you are. Every time. I mean, it's, there's, when you finally let 
the trust. So I actually just, <laughs> you're going to like this. There's a shirt that I made called phases of the entrepreneur. And I was just so sick of feeling so high on life one day. And then just like total shit the next day within even 12 hours, within sometimes four hours, you feel on top of the world. And then you're just like, Oh my God, I have nothing figured out. My life is a shit show. <laughs> and I finally was like, you know, I'm seeing this. And when you are in those moments of, I feel like a shit show, there's nothing you can say or do that feels like it's going to pass. It's going to be over with, like you're going to get out of it. Cause it feels, you know, with the entrepreneur, the thing you have to focus on the most is your amygdala, your stress brain. Why, you know, when we go into that sense of, Oh my God, I am, I don't have income coming in or I have a huge check going out. If I don't create something, it's going to fall apart. We go into this total animal brain of, you know, stress, 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 stress. And that that's, there's no room for growth or abundance when you are in that space. And so when I finally was, I was looking, it was a full moon and I was like, oh my God. And it's the same with waves. Everything is cyclical. And so it's phases of the entrepreneur and it's like the full moon is like, I'm the shit. And then it goes like waning and it's like, oh no, oh shit. Oh my God. I need a nine to five. And then it's back to what we want. So every time I'm in those moments, I just remember this is a cycle, whether I'm out of it in two weeks or one month or two hours, I will get out of it because I've always been able to figure out a solution. And so when you trust that you have everything inside you to get out of a hole, then all of a sudden you can release that and not worry so much about it and know that it's happening in its own time. And that's been the biggest shift that I've made the last year, you know, really understanding that if I can let go and know that I'm on my own journey and in its own time and it opens doors like you couldn't even imagine. Mm. I love that you said that you trust everything inside of you because I think sometimes when we have, we, we look externally to solve very like internal problems. And so when we're going through these phases, like the reality is that we get caught in these sort of, um, we live in lack, right? We don't live in abundance, like you said. Well, the answer to that is to look inside of yourself and to realize that the only way out of this is to change your mindset to one that would allow you to live in abundance and to create, in, and I guess just go into creation mode to get your way out of it. But instead, we typically look to external sources and we try to look for other people. And so, I don't know, I just like that you, that you said you look internal because I think that's so important. Oh, yeah. I think, you know, I'm, I feel blessed with the fact that I always felt like I had somewhat, even though I had a lot of insecurity issues and a lot of self-doubt at stages in my life and, you know, self-hatred even, which really pushed me to get to the gym. It took a lot of self-hatred, mm -hmm. which turned it, it still turned into a good thing. So I'm not saying that intentions have to be perfect for you to have abundance in your life, but there is something about the sense of self. And there's a quote I I used recently, it's like, uh, when you, you have to teach your sense of self to stand up on its own two feet instead of, instead of on all the people that you meet, something like that, where it's, we're so used to saying, I don't know the right answer. I, you know, I've been told that by the way, by my education, I've been told that by my parents, I've been told that by my family, I've been told that by fellow entrepreneurs or business owners that the way I, I want to do it is probably not the best, or we just don't even give ourselves a chance to figure it out. We go to books, we go to self-help, we go to podcasts. And as much as I love those, that is still not what you need to do. And when you don't stay in your lane, um, it's going to not be the full expression of what you can really create. So I think that's a, it's a great point of just saying you absolutely have to know your gut instinct is always right. And if you don't believe it, uh, if you feel like it's failed you, then look at maybe the situation around you. Maybe it was more, there was ego involved. Maybe there was, there was, uh, something that wasn't meant for you involved because when it's truly in alignment with what you want, when you know that it's what you want and it's really coming from a sense of, good intentions, that's it, just really good intentions, then it, it's going to line up. Hmm. I like that you you recognize that sort of that self-loathing got you to a point because that's uh, something I think we, we neglect sometimes, especially with this sort of self-love movement. It's this idea that like, well, having a chip on your shoulder actually can be a really strong motivator, but then you get to a point where you realize, okay, what got me here isn't going to get me there. And so you have to figure out a way to 
look inward and, and be okay with just you, who you are, without all of the things that we wrap our identity up in order to continue to progress. Um, but yeah, it's worth mentioning that that can be a powerful motivator to get you to a certain point. Yes. And I think under being real about that, because I think with all these business coaches and kind of, uh, this wave of, I can help you make a six figure, I don't know, whatever, whatever you see on your Facebook or Instagram. Um, what I see all the time is that you cannot create from a place of stress. And I think that's just total bullshit because I was stressed out for the first six years of me training. You know, I didn't start my own business, but you're like, Oh shit. You know, I have to, I have to fund this. I don't want to take on an investor. I don't want to take on debt. How do I figure out a solution so that I can launch X, Y, Z. And so it's, it's pressure, it's stress, but it is a, it's just understanding that at some point that has to shift. So same thing as when I went to the gym, I didn't like who I saw in the mirror. So I went to the gym. I still didn't like who I went, saw in the mirror. So I kept going to the gym. So I think giving that some sort of respect in a way, it's just not talked about enough because my best ideas came out of a sense of, I have to figure out how to fund this project. And if I don't, then I'm screwed. Like I'm not going to be able to pay for this for 900 impacts coming across the ocean. So it's, it's a really big, uh, I think that's just the gamble, but it's not the best. It's not ideal, but for anybody that's just starting out, that is where you're going to be. So understanding that and being aware of it and not letting it consume you and maybe cut off some of the, some of those creative channels is probably the best approach. And then there is a point you'll start to recognize, Oh, I can now trust this. My team is there. Um, I feel safe. Now I can create, and that's a different type of creation. Yeah, I, that is a really good point. That's like one of the things I've noticed since I've been a full-time entrepreneur is this idea that my life, like everything is elevated. Like the mundane things are elevated. I'm like, where I used to be getting a paycheck every two weeks from the military, it was really easy for me to blow stuff off because I'm going to get the paycheck either way. Now that it's my life, I'm like this, sending this email is elevated. Like everything is important but it's in the best way. There's like a heaviness to life and it's like, I don't know. It just, everything matters more, I guess. And that's one of the great things yeah. about doing your own thing. And that's, what's so important to understand too, is like, well, you know, I love the idea of this working for your own self and working for being your own boss, but it does take that type of personality. It does take that. I do well under pressure. I do well when I know that this email is that important because a lot of people, if they know that email is important and it doesn't happen, it doesn't get sent or they overthink it, uh, you know, it's not perfect yet. They still have a product that's in process. They have an idea, but they don't have execution and they don't do it. They hesitate. That's, that doesn't get you anywhere. You have to be, it's that all in mentality. And so when I see people really struggling, I mean, it's okay to work for somebody else if that's the case, but uh, yeah, I totally think that it's, it takes a type of human and, um, some of us do thrive in it. And some of us are like, Oh my God, this can't be anything but stressful. So not to discourage anybody that feels stressed out, please don't take it that way, but do know that it is, it's a, um, it's a trait that you almost have to learn that it's every email is just as important as every phone call and every phone call is ever important as the best business meeting with the top person in your industry. You have to treat it that way. Yeah. And I, I think it's worth pointing out that we live in this sort of culture where being an entrepreneur is like the rock star of our time. And I don't want to be the person that says everyone should be because I do not believe that that's the case. And I don't wish this life on anybody. I just happen to realize how built for it. Like I personally am. And even so to the point now, I'm like, I realize how unemployable I am. And I'm like, I can't believe I ever did anything else. However, it, is, it takes a very certain kind of archetype in order to thrive in that environment. And that's important to recognize. Yeah. Do you ever do, um, have you ever done the Enneagram test? Yes. Somebody just sent this to me. Yeah. Do you know what number you are? Yeah. Seven, swing to an eight. <laughs> <laughs> we're the same human. That's awesome. I think that it's so true. Like I have this idea, it's called the hustle gene and it's just like little things that are like going to say you're set up for a good, it's like so silly, but it's your personality on the Enneagram. Almost all of us are sevens and the wing eight is even better because you're super determined and creative, uh -huh. which is awesome. And then you can look at, uh, 
what was the other ones that I was looking at? Oh, even like the way you were born and the way you were raised. It's just like, it's really fun to see all these factors that might make you predisposed to being a good boss for yourself. So that's funny that you're a seven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you, do you want to explain a little bit about what that is just for the, for the audience that are listening? For sure. So the Enneagram is something I discovered a couple years ago. I love personality tests. I usually, you know, I always, spirit animals are my, are my jam. And I think it's so fun for people to understand who they are in order to be a better version of themselves. And in the space of being in health and wellness and being your own boss, that's just of utmost importance. And so when I was looking at personality tests, Enneagram, E-N-N-E-A-G-R-A-M, uh, it was the most profound shift where I saw it and I was like, how does this know who I am? And it's only type one through type nine. You take a free test by doing free Enneagram or you can take a $12 test and you get an email a day if you want about your type. And it just helps you explain what you could look like if you're really healthy and what you look like when you're really off and then how you can be better in those moments. And so for seven, it's kind of our personality to be always moving and we're always looking for the next thing, which allows us not, it doesn't allow us to be present. And so my, my goal is how can I be more present? Because in, 10 years, this is the part that I'm going to be the most excited to tell everyone about this part, this process, this journey. And I'm too busy looking at the next thing I'm creating to be in the moment. And so it's really powerful. There's lots of resources online. I did a fun podcast with this Enneagram expert. Uh, that was really cool because she goes through all the types if you guys want more, but um, it's awesome. Everyone, I highly suggest it. I make everyone I know take it. My whole team takes it. It makes you work better with the people you're around and it just helps you understand yourself a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So story of my life, avoiding the moments. Um, (laughs) I think that, and it sucks because it's the only thing we're promised in this life, right? And so it it sucks. It's like a quality that's hard. It helps success metrics, but it's not always great in the interim. Um, also too, when you recognize some things about your personality, you can, you can see where some of your strengths can become shadows when you like live too much in your ego or too much in some of the lower parts of yourself. But then you can also look at, there are probably things that you've been struggling with in your life that, that are manifesting as shadows right now, but there's actually probably a way that that could be a really big strength. And it gives you that opportunity to look at that thing from a different filter and, and then think through how that might actually help you and and not hinder you. Mm, Yeah. I love that. I mean, self, when I look at all the things I've done to help my business grow in whatever business it is, there's only so much you can do externally. And so it's really the work that you can do internally that helps you communicate better. It helps you react in, in precious decisions better. And so I'm a, I believe that it's, taking those things and learning about yourself and then knowing no matter what it is, good or bad, it'll come back to you. And if you're open to it, if you're aware of it in a way that can help you down the road. Mm. So you mentioned in that, uh, that you had somebody on your podcast. Um, was that the meathead hippie podcast that you were talking about that episode? Yeah. So meathead hippie, uh, her name's Kathy and it was so fun cause she's, she's actually like a minister and she uses the Enneagram. I'm not really, you know, I love everyone in all walks of life, but I personally am not religious, but she uses the Enneagram in her work, even in religious, it was so cool. So you can get really down the rabbit hole for sure. <laughs> okay. That's cool. Um, so the, the meathead part I think is coming through clear. Like you had exercise in these moments, um, early on in your life and it really helped shape who you are. Uh, where does the hippie part come in? Yeah. So I'm trying to think of like, I've always been a little bit of a hippie as far as, uh, woo woo energy work. So I love getting my tarot cards read. I loved going to, you know, energy healers and Reiki. But I think for me personally, when I really got into it was when my adrenals. So I had just launched, uh, the second company, the impact, the backpack. Um, and I remember just being, I was competing in CrossFit and I was still doing all my online, you know, emilystrom.com stuff. And I just was like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then my body was like, you're not fine at all. You're, you're a shit show. So I really just low energy. Didn't want to wake up, hated everybody, cried all the time, was like, this is horrible. This is a horrible life. Like, why am I putting so much pressure? And I just wouldn't stop. And so 
I started to understand uh, adrenal health and adrenal dysfunction and what it was doing to my body. You know, I had a lot of hip issues that really made me stop in my tracks when it came to um, lifting. And so I was forced to kind of pause and really take some steps back and start doing float tanks and start doing uh, saunas all the time and then started to learn about herbs for adrenals. And that was kind of the step into, it was flower essences and it was adaptogenic herbs. And it was like, my mind just couldn't stop learning. So I started going to, uh, there's a really cool school here in Boulder, Colorado school of clinical herbalism. And it was like, this is my shit. This (laughs) is amazing. And so I've always been somebody, even as a kid that had like with alongside my, my morbid poetry, you know, books on plants and botany and trying to figure out the connections between, so for example, nutri- nu- nutrient deficiencies, if I'm craving chocolate, why am I craving chocolate? It's not because I'm a bad person. It's not because I'm weak. It's not because I'm just trained to have chocolate all the time. It's actually a little bit deeper. It's because my body needs some magnesium. So taking magnesium now curbs that chocolate craving. So it's the same thing. I've always been like a Nancy Drew detective trying to connect the dots. And the herb herb piece was so cool because I didn't want to take 20 supplements. I didn't want to take, you know, all this, all this stuff that people wanted me to take. And I, you know, at some point supplements are really powerful, but you can also get a lot from herbs. And so my hippie world kind of opened up a lot. And I pull tarot cards every day and I have a pendulum and I, I, I'm I'm almost too much sometimes, but I still really love it because it helps balance out my my bicep curls. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> uh, you know, in this Western culture, you know, more is better. That's like we all worship the altar of more. It's, we end up on this sort of hedonic treadmill all the time, and because of that, one of the ways, one of the sort of symptoms or byproducts of that lifestyle is that we're all walking around with inadequate adrenal function or or production, I should say, hormone production. For people that are listening to this, that maybe they don't, I mean, the idea of like trying to do the Nancy Drew detective thing and link all of these cravings into what's going on in the bigger picture, that's a lot. Is there, what do you suggest is like the first step for somebody that is living with this low level fatigue? Yeah. I mean, it's understanding. I think the first step is if you took coffee out of your life, what would your day look like? Whoa. And that's. You're not into it. I don't know. <laughs> what else you got? Uh, step two. Uh, <laughs> well, that was the eye opener for me because I thought my energy was really good. And so, I guess a brief description of adrenals. Adrenals, the root being adrenaline. So, if you think of your stress and needing to leave some a situation very quickly, whether that's traffic or whether that's a, a bear chasing you, your body responds the same way. So, it shoots cortisol through your system. But cortisol is only supposed to be used in sparing cases, and it's used all the time in our society. So, this overdue of cortisol cortisol puts us in this stress state. And there's times where we have too much cortisol and then it gets to the point where after a a long time, our body says, F you, I now have too little. I don't have any to give you. And so we really start tapping into that for me, for my athletes, it's like the incontinence. So actually it sounds crazy, but glute activation, not being able to happen, peeing on the floor in your lifts, um, really struggling with waking up without a lot of coffee, not having a good time in your workout or after your workout, you have headaches or you feel like it takes hours and hours to recover. All of this is just signs that your body is just pushed to the max and we can handle stress, but not as much as we put on our body. So, um, I really think the first thing is just understanding what your energy is. And I think, you know, I have, uh, the body awareness project is one of my favorite projects that I did because it talks about this to extent, like with 15 other guests about what you can do in the gym and what you can do with blood sugar and what you can do with supplements in order to figure out how to sleep better and function better because it's a process. It's not something that happens overnight because you didn't get there overnight. And so um, I think the best thing to do is say, how do I wake up in the morning? Do I wake up groggy? Did I sleep through the night? If you wake up every night in the middle of the night around three o'clock, that's usually a blood sugar issue. So then I would just say, let's focus on eating really nourishing foods eating enough fat at those meals, um, and making sure that we're digesting them well. And if any of those pieces are off long term, it'll cause adrenal stress, but that's something we could always focus on. And the last piece, just because I see this over and over with overtraining is your training 
has to be smart. And for me, as somebody, I feel like I can say this because I did this for years. Competing in CrossFit was the worst thing I could have done for my body. And I only noticed it when I was trying to do my emails after a workout. And I, it was day to day. It was you, you either get a good workout in, whatever I thought a good workout was, or you complete your emails. I could never do both. And I was like, I should be able to do this. And then I finally realized, well, maybe the way I'm training doesn't need to be so aggressive. I can get more results with less training because cortisol is catabolic. So when you look at your muscles, if you're like, why am I not, I feel puffy or I feel like I'm working out so hard, but I still don't see muscle definition. Sometimes it's not that you need more protein. It's that you have to work on your stress levels and your sleep. And so um, that, that those are all some eye openers and signs and symptoms that hopefully are helpful. Yeah. So I I had like a couple of key takeaways that I was just like kind of noting just for the listener. I think that I will, I love coffee. I understand that I list that I drink it way too often, especially now because I'm like writing my second book and I'm like living off coffee. Uh, But it is borrowed energy and that's important. It's not producing any extra energy that you would have in your body. You're borrowing it from yourself at a later time. And so just like any other bank account, if you continue to take, you are going to be stuck with a deficit. And so I will say to your point, I agree. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Well, let me, I need to send you some herbal coffee uh, as a thank you for having me on anyway. So I will, it's kind of my way of when I, and I have coffee, don't get me wrong, but coffee for me is my crutch when I really, really need it. And it just tastes so freaking good. I mean, I've had it since I was 10 or 11. It's like, it's the ritual. It's the conversation that comes with it. It's so much more than that. So I, um, I think that the best thing to do is when you have coffee, the first, you know, I try to say, drink a lot of water first, try not to have coffee the first, first thing in the morning, because that's when your cortisol is naturally the highest. And so the coolest thing that I learned when I took out coffee, or at least took, um, a couple hours before that first cup, it was, and I don't always do this. Don't, I'm not insane. I love, I have an espresso machine and I live off of it as well. But I know that if I'm getting fatigued, if I'm not sleeping well, if my workouts are shit, I need to say, okay, let's push the coffee back, see what your energy does, let your body naturally wake up. And then you can have the coffee that it won't let you crash in the three or four, which is when we want it again, two or three or four, we need more coffee because we had it. We, what you just said was perfect. You already expended it. You got to give it back. And now it wants more. Yeah. I mean, it's three o'clock. This is cold brew and you just described my entire day. <laughs> well, it's okay. Cause I have a little cup of espresso too. So we're on the same boat. <laughs> All right. Um, another, another like kind of takeaway from that was the idea. And you know, this has been brought to the forefront of the conversation because of the keto phase and all of this the ketogenic diet, but the idea that fat is the precursor for hormone production. And most of us eat a fat deficient diet just from <laughs> terrible government involvement in marketing and the FDA and all that doesn't matter. But, uh, just the fact that most of us would benefit hormonally just from adding more fat into our diet. Like that was another point right there that I think is huge. I am obsessed with fat, especially for somebody that's had brain trauma, for, especially for somebody that has had yo-yo energy and hangriness. You know, the, my only qualms about the keto movement, men tend to do way better on it. And I also think that when you think about the way you digest fats, that is equally as important as using fat as fuel because we can't get to the point of fuel if we're not digesting those fats. And so the biggest issue I see is just when you get into that higher fat diet, be nice to your gallbladder, like really work on making sure you ease into the higher fat diet. We're not just all of a sudden full keto or high fat or you know, following a meal plan and we have butter and bacon, you will just completely traumatize your body. And sometimes it works for a period of time, but it does catch up, especially for women. I see it a lot. It just causes leaky gut if those fats aren't digested well. So dandelion root tea and beets, and I sometimes do gallbladder support, but Outside of that, high fat diets are the absolute best when it comes to stabilizing energy, helping your hormone production, especially cholesterol in your diet, and then just feeling like a just feeling like you don't have to depend on counting calories to still see results. So yes, huge believer in the high fat diet. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that was great. Great advice. Like the on ramp there can people just are like, Oh, I'm doing that now, that's what gets me results and then uh-huh. crash. Yeah. Uh, The the other thing you brought up was the idea of CrossFit. Like one thing I noticed in my life is 
I never looked better than when I stopped CrossFitting twice a day. And it's probably just because the idea of intensity should be earned and we don't, we like act like intensity is the thing. And like, Mm -hmm. as you mentioned, your body doesn't know the difference between cortisol that's produced from a workout or cortisol that's produced from you getting in a fight with your wife or girlfriend or whatever, boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just wanted to bring it up like CrossFit, yes, but like any sort of high intensity interval training, like if that's part of your lifestyle and you're living with this chronic fatigue, you know, the idea that intensity is earned is something that you could definitely benefit from um, just scaling it back literally for the for the sake of your adrenals. Man, I fall. So I have so many places I could go with this. I call my gym. My gym, I just opened the CrossFit Rehab Center, <laughs> which I'm going to get in trouble for at some point. But sure. <laughs> it, it is so true. You know, when I was, so when I was CrossFitting and also I do muscle testing and like I call it my witch doctory things and testing people for adrenal issues or gut issues. One of the things I kept seeing with every person that CrossFitted was insulin resistance. And I would see their diet and I would see their body type and it just didn't make sense. But if they had any amount of sugar or carbohydrate, even if it was a sweet potato, they would bonk and then they would go to coffee and then they would do it again. And so when I was asking some doctors and sports, uh, sports researchers, like, why is this happening? It's because if you think of your cell, cell to cell, we're just a big pile of cells. Anything damaging can help, can, it can basically cause our cell to not receive insulin the way it's supposed to. So your diet could be on point, but if your workout is so intense and so damaging and it causes insulin sensitivity issues, meaning we no longer respond to carbohydrates well, that's a huge problem. That was like the first light bulb of, oh my God, this is like not just making me tired. This is damaging my cells and I am nowhere near recovered enough to do it again. And so that's the thing. It can be great in small doses, but every day or even three times a week at that intensity is not, you, you can't recover enough unless that's all you do or unless you have the best supplements and the best diet. And there's people that can do it, right? But there's, there's a big difference between CrossFit games athletes and then most CrossFitters. And so that was the eye opener for me. And when I realized, okay, what does my body need. It was always, I was craving just doing old school bodybuilding workouts because that's how I started. I always started with bodybuilding and then I found CrossFit. So I kind of blended the two together. And so that's really the concept of the gym. My favorite way to train is always pick a primary lift. And that's some sort of, you know, it could be cleans and jerks and snatches if you really love them. But for me, it's squat, deadlift, press in some sort of degree. And I love the conjugate method specifically because instead of just doing heavy, heavy weight, you can do bands on the barbell, you can do chains on the barbell. You can change the intensity by lowering the weight, but still having high resistance with the bands. It's so less taxing on your CNS. And then I complement it with if you want to do some Tabata, if you want to do some more bodybuilding sculpting, or if you want to do some more athlete stuff, you can. And that's how I really created the program for the gym is, oh my gosh, people don't have an a choice when they come into a class. They just are doing this high intensity class. They feel great because they sweat and they breathe breathe really hard, but at some point they will plateau or they will get injured because of what that high intensity does over and over. And when it comes to adrenal issues, the best thing that you can do is cut cardio. I mean, you can, aerobic is the best, but you cannot, you have to one, help your carbohydrate be the right number. If you're too low in carb and you're doing high intensity intervals, it's going to hit you in the face. So don't train fasted if you're doing high intensity interval training, but then also say, okay, if I am going to do some high intensity interval training, make sure there's enough carbohydrate, about 30 grams of carbohydrate before that lift session or before that workout or just cut cardio because that's what I did. And my body was like, this is amazing. I finally can be less stressed. Just focus on primary lifts. Just focus on bodybuilding style workouts. Give your time, give your body time to rest and recover. And it is really cool when you're like, wow, I, I am less stressed and I see more results because of that. That's a long answer. I'm sorry. No, it's great. That's absolutely perfect. I think, uh, just one of the things you said, just the idea that exercise can be damaging, like that, just having the awareness of that is huge because that conversation about, you know, training for lifestyle and training for CrossFit as a sport has been really talked about ad nauseum in a lot of podcasts, but, but just, just recognizing CrossFit or <laughs> CrossFit, but any exercise can be damaging. The more you train to compete, the more you're tipping the scale in that direction versus training for health. And so just that awareness, I think is perfect. 
Mm-hmm. I Yeah, it's pretty interesting how uh, we're just, you know, the all-in personality tends to be the entrepreneur, be our own boss personality. We actually get something out of that because it's the dopamine receptors in our brain and it is an addiction. So also understanding that I'm addicted to this, whether it's going on a long run or whether it's going to a CrossFit gym, you are allowing your brain to release in a way it doesn't know how to do. And so understanding there's other mechanisms that you can still feel that type of high because I was just addicted to that high, that competitiveness. It was a lot of ego, um, but also just my brain loves movement. I've had a lot of concussions. And so that's my only way of feeling good about myself, but giving yourself patience and finding something else that could fit and might be more long-term. I love it. There's like a million rabbit holes I could go down, but I want to be mindful of your time. So uh, I'll get to the last question. So I know that you are, I don't know when, but I know that you're turning 30 soon. I am. So I am a Christmas baby, uh, December 23rd. Oh, I'm the 22nd. Right on. Ah, uh, that's so crazy. We're the same cusp and the same sign. That's cool. Yeah. So you, are you more a Sag or a Capricorn? Capricorn for sure. Have you ever seen the Sagittarius Capricorn cusp? No. Okay. I want you to Google cusp of prophecy. Okay. I want you to let me know if that's your cusp because it's like, I thought I was a Capricorn, and then I went and got my Vedic astrology read, and it was like time and date of birth, and no woo-woo, just facts. And she was like, oh, no, you're you're definitely more Sagittarius. And I was like, what? So I dug into it. I think, let me know, cusp of prophecy, if that's you. All right. Yeah, I want to check that out. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh God, so many things. Okay. So turning 30 – you've had a pretty wild life. So you mentioned, you know, being in reality TV and sort of finding your voice. Well, really in, in public, one of the things that's interesting is that I think about just in your story is like, I've been able to find a lot of my voice with not many people listening. And as I, our audience has grown, it's actually been perfect as, as I've grown along with it. And I've kind of got my message a little more perfected and I didn't have to like seal all my follies like on MTV. And so when you think about in the last like 30 years, is there any lessons that you've learned that you could just pull away from, from this life that you've had that if you could give, if you could give advice and everybody would hear it, you know, based on your last 30 years, what would you tell people? Oh, geez. You know, I haven't had like, I've been avoiding the, I need to process this decade and you're, you're, it's time. So I appreciate that question more than you realize because I'm like, I'm okay about turning 30. I think so, I think people make it a big deal, but it is kind of the end of an era. So I need to like, you know, really process it. And when I think of it, especially the last 10 years, because I was on Real World when I was 20, um, fake ID and everything. I remember being like, I am so not in my place. I look at the people around me and I did this for in any situation where I was like, I do not fit in this role. I am not the person that should be on TV. I'm not the most entertaining. I'm not the most, you know, glamorous or the per- the put together. I have dirt in my fingernails sometimes and my hair always looks like shit. Like I don't care and I never will, but I would be put in these roles where I was around people that cared so much and I felt so out of place. And so there was always this conversation I had to have with myself and it took a long time for me to finally be at peace with it. There was no other option for me to just be who I was, but being who I was sometimes never felt enough. I felt out of place or I felt like it was a mistake and none of it was a mistake. The people, I think that's the lesson. It's you are showing up every day and sometimes you're like, I'm not the right fit or I don't look the right part. But if it's who you are, if you just are you, that is the tribe that will be attracted to you. And there's nothing that replaces authenticity. And so I wish 10 years ago, I could have told myself like, M, stop touching your hair. Your hair is fine. You know, just being who you are, that, that was my first audience. It was the first people, people that didn't relate to the people with the perfect hair and the people with the perfect body and the people with, you know, their shit together. I attracted those people and they were the people that would be my best friends and I would invite them over. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that just being who I was, was allowing me to create this path, create this lane that turned into what it is today. And so I think that's the lesson. It's that you will always feel out of place. You will always feel inadequate. You will always doubt. And if you just are you, if you just, if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. If it doesn't feel 
a hundred percent, don't do it. If somebody offers you something and it could be a good fit, but it's something in you deep down is like, you know, I don't really, I'm not into it. Say no. And every time I did that, it allowed me to have opportunities with the people that mattered and the the career trajectory changed because I didn't settle for things because I thought I should. So um, it's always going to be a lesson. I'm going to have 10 more of those things in 10 months of saying this, I feel out of place. I'm not the right person, but I, you are the right person. Uh, you, you just have to authentically be you and don't change a thing. I love that. I think that as we're sort of developing ourselves, especially psychologically, we're trying to make sense of the world. It can feel like while we're developing that the world is sort of against you um, or that the universe is sort of indifferent to you. And I think one of the things that can really help just just to find your place in the in the chaotic world that we live in can be to, you know, ask yourself more questions about the world at large. Like, is this life an adventure that you get to go on or is it a trial that you have to endure? And when you kind of come to the realization of which one it is, it allows you to realize that things that we live in a universe that doesn't make mistakes. And so it allows you to kind of be at peace with who you are and what you've done and where you've been and where you're going. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it's, it's so hard to trust uh, the universe, but when you do, I mean, you just, you're going to, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And we forget that all the time. So here we go. 30, the yeah. three zero. I'm excited. I mean, fuck, I had a great 10 years. I can't complain. So it'll be fun to see what the next 10 brings. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. So for people that are listening to this, first of all, we like really covered the gamut and topics today. So I really appreciate you being open and taking the time. Um, of course. Yeah, yeah. To give your input. For people that are following this and they want to follow along with your journey or support the businesses that you have, where's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, I think Emily Schramm, and that's my Instagram and also my main website where you can kind of see all the things going on, Emily, S-C-H-R-O-M-M, and then my podcast, Meathead Hippie, like we talked about, and you can kind of go down the rabbit hole. So, you know, I love... um, I love teaching people how to work out outside. So then you can find the rabbit hole for the MPAC, the body awareness project that we talked about for adrenals or gut health. You can find through the same website challenges and nutrition programs. I love it all. So, um, all I would just say Emily Perfect. And we'll link all of that up in the show notes of this episode. Perfect. Uh, Emily, I really appreciate you taking the time and thanks for sharing with us. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me, Rick. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or would like to suggest a guest, Send me an email at rick at louaviv.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,